Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Professor Jennifer Morton is with us. Professor Morton teaches philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania. She has written a compelling monograph entitled Moving Up Without Losing Your Way, The Ethical Costs of Upward Mobility. The book is required pre-read for the entering class at Princeton University. In the book, she sees a conflict between a striving student's aspiration for career and educational advancement and obligations to family and community. We are delighted to welcome Professor Jennifer Morton to the program. Jennifer, congratulations on your book. It's uh, just a marvelous guidepost for uh, any entering college student. In fact, it's a great guidepost for college graduates. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, it's, uh, it's really a marvelous message. So maybe we can start with uh, uh, you're telling us something about your background because you write about strivers. Uh, and I was curious as to whether you consider yourself to be a striver and uh, whether you had the same type of conflict between uh, uh, personal loyalties and uh, uh, aspirations, uh, both educational and career aspirations uh, that you write about in the book. Yeah, thank you, Jim. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so whether I consider myself a striver, it's, it's sort of a tricky question. I think in some ways um, I do. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And I grew up with uh, my working class grandmother who raised me. But there are other elements of my story that make it uh, less straightforward. So I grew up in Lima, Peru. Um, and as I said, my grandmother raised me for the most part, but I also attended a very fancy private school, the American School of Lima. And so ever since I was uh, small, I attended for K through 12, I was negotiating sort of going home to my grandmother who uh, doesn't speak English and, and grew up pretty working class. She was a secretary and being in school with people who were um, from very wealthy backgrounds and having the majority of my schooling done in English. Um, and so it was always this negotiating back and forth. Um, um, when I was growing up in Peru in the 80s and 90s, uh, we were experiencing a lot of um, economic turmoil, terrorism, high inflation. And my grandmother's hope was that by sending me to this um, fancy private school, this would be a way out for me, that I would eventually uh, leave the country and make a better life elsewhere. So my grandmother from when I was very small had this very striver immigrant idea. We were going to, you know, I was going to immigrate and I was going to uh, kind of uh, move up the socioeconomic ladder. By the time I was in high school, my family was much better off. My, my mom and my aunt immigrated to Europe and uh, when I was young, that's why I grew up with my grandmother and, and they um, were much better off economically. So I think I, I felt quite comfortable economically um, when I was older, but I still had this sort of negotiating some of the, um, I think the, the, the tension between um, being part of a family who had not attended college, didn't really know what I was going through and then uh, being on the path to college, and I came to the United States to go to Princeton, and so then being at a, not just a college, but a very selective, demanding college environment, and, and sort of negotiating those two places, and so there was always this feeling of having a foot in two different worlds, and that's, that's really kind of the story of many strivers, you know, people who grow up in whether it's low income backgrounds or to working class parents who haven't gone to college and then are trying to, you know, attain a measure of the American dream by pursuing higher education, but then find themselves kind of trying to enter a community very much unlike that in which they grew up, perhaps, and also retain a connection to their family and their friends um, and the community in which they grew up. And for some strivers, this is, the distance I have to travel is very far. For me, what characterizes being a striver is the sense that you're seeking opportunities in a community or in a place at which you might not feel totally at home, um, 
And, and, and that's, the, that's a common theme that you see in some of the stories I discuss. Uh, how old were you when you emigrated to the United States? I was, uh, I had just turned 19, I think. I was. 19, so mm -hmm. you, you really came to the United States to attend Princeton. Yeah. And did you come with other members of your family or did you come all by yourself? All by myself. <laughs> um, That's yeah, pretty plotting. Yeah, it was. And I, and I remember, um, you know, getting to Princeton. That was the first time I, will, I was on campus was when I got there to attend college um, and taking the shuttle from Newark Airport to Princeton's campus and just had a suitcase with all my stuff and had no idea what I was getting myself into. But you uh, uh, went upstairs to, uh, I guess, your third floor dormitory room in Blair Hall, uh, and you sat on the bed and you cried. You, you, you had a sense of alienation. And uh, uh, Michelle Obama went to Princeton, uh, uh, wrote about her sense of alienation as a black woman on campus, even though there were many other black women at the time. Uh, so tell us about the sense of alienation and what were your feelings and uh, how did you resolve them? I knew that it would be hard and that um, I would feel out of place. So I had some sense to expect that. And I think that is something that in some ways protected me from, from what I see with some other students who are strivers, which is that this feeling of internalizing this feeling of not belonging. By that, I mean, is that you get to college campus, you might feel like you don't belong. And then you think this is something about me, right? I'm not smart enough, or I'm not supposed to be here or um, something like that. In college, when I went to college, the term first generation college student wasn't even a thing, right? Like I, was, I didn't really have these words to conceptualize of my experience in that way. So the language I had available was that of being an immigrant. Um, and that's how I thought of my experience, that as an immigrant, uh, you know, I was going to encounter cultural challenges, social challenges, emotional challenges, and that was part of the experience. Um, I, was, I was lucky that I did make very good friends that first year that I was at Princeton, who were, for the most part, they're not only others, uh, some other students of color, um, and uh, other people that lived in my hallway that I really uh, connected to and I'm still friends with. And that really helped anchor me um, at Princeton. And uh, in retrospect, what I think really helped was that some of the friends I made were not immigrants themselves, but children of immigrants. So a few of my friends were uh, Asian American and their parents had immigrated to the United States. Um, and so I think they had an understanding and a kind of uh, flexibility around maybe some of the things I didn't understand. They were willing to explain things to me. But in my experience as a college professor, what I've seen is that some students who come are strivers from the United States, right? They might be coming from a rural town or a low-income neighborhood or a, a, a working-class neighborhood and arrive to a place like Princeton, they might feel the same feelings of alienation and not belonging, but interpreted as something that has to do with them um, and, and not necessarily kind of a feature of the social mechanisms that are in place at, at colleges like that. Uh, your challenge, as you describe it, was really a challenge of identity. Uh, and uh, trying to uh, understand who you were in the context of a, a larger, uh, really American community environment. But the people you write about, uh, it seems uh, their challenges were economic, largely. It's sort of the tension, uh, you know, can I stay in college when uh, I have to go back and support my family or I have a, a loved one who needs... Uh, uh, health care, and uh, there's no, we can't afford a, a health care provider, so I've got to go back and, and uh, be the health care provider. Yeah. And uh, in so doing, uh, interrupting education or uh, uh, terminating it entirely. Uh, so is that a, a different kind of ethical dilemma from uh, the one you yourself experienced? 
Yeah, certainly. So there are, as you said, Jim, the issues of identity, but often for strivers, um, the challenges that their families are facing, and these are challenges that many um, low-income families face, are ones that um, they can't really distance themselves from fully, right? Um, emotionally, uh, financially, right? Um, so uh, a striver who grows up in a family in which there are lots of financial challenges might feel the sense that they want to help their family, right? They want to provide support, whether it's that the family needs childcare for a younger sibling or elder care for a grandparent or just help financially because somebody lost their job. Strivers are, feel the sense of connection to their families as we all do, but they also feel like there's something they want to do to help. Um, the problem is that doing that can detract from then pursuing their own educational ambitions and their own career ambitions. Um, and so they end up feeling torn between these two sources of value, the values that they want to cultivate in their own lives, whether it's go to college, have a, a career that they enjoy, and being there for their families, their friends, their communities. Um, so I saw that when I was teaching at uh, the City College of New York. Um, where I taught for many years, and a lot of my students at CUNY lived at home. Um, and so for them, the challenge wasn't only knowing that family was struggling back home, right, which is the case in um, some residential colleges, but it was actually um, going back home every evening to confront and deal with the challenges that their families were facing um, and having to negotiate this back and forth. And so Many of the students that I saw that um, had challenges finishing their degrees were, um, were facing these challenges because um, their families needed them in some way or their friends or their community. Um, and they were trying to be there and um, be supportive. And this was attracting from them coming to class or studying for an exam or writing a paper and this often would lead to students getting derailed in their pursuit of a college education. Um, and so that tension for a lot of students is there, um, but for students like students at CUNY and actually many college students across the United States that um, might be living at home or going to college close to home, those challenges can really be a day-to-day -day struggle of figuring out um, how can I help my family who today childcare felt through or right during COVID, schools closed. Who's taking care of the kids while the parents are out at work doing, you know, whether it's at grocery stores or as essential workers, um, college students step in. And I, um, I saw this during COVID that um, some of my students who went back home were um, taking on extra jobs, uh, homeschooling their cousins or their younger siblings and trying to play their role in supporting their families. But of course, this is very difficult to do if at the same time you're taking a full load of college courses and trying to do all the work you need to um, do well in those courses. Well, that gives rise to what you call the ethical dilemma. But at CUNY, I think you write that about 78% of uh, the students were people of color, 38% uh, or 39% uh, came from families with an income level of $20,000 a year or less. 30% uh, were working uh, 20 hours a week or more to help support their families or support themselves uh, while they're going to college. Uh, can you contrast that with the student body at Princeton? Was, uh, uh, was it anything like that? Uh, just using Princeton as an elite institution that uh, you're familiar with? Um, yeah, there are differences, um, very important differences that have to do with the nature of the institution that a student attends, right? So a place like Princeton or Penn, where I am now, um, has very generous financial aid packages, right? And so um, that is different than what a student going to CUNY, well, there is aid, there's financial aid, but 
Um, students often have to worry about housing and food, whereas here, the, the, the packages are more generous in that way. Students are also living on campus and so far from their families. And that can create this kind of buffer, right, between the needs their, of their families and, and their own education. Although it's not, you know, it's not like a wall, of course, students call and text and hear about what's happening to their families and that can affect their own educational experience. But there are also gaps. And I think in some ways um, at schools like Princeton and Penn, some of the students that have serious financial challenges often aren't noticed or seen by faculty as having those because we have the assumption that the institution is taking care of their financial needs. But as um, you know, the work of um, Anthony Jack uh, in The Privileged Poor kind of shows is that students do confront housing insecurity and food insecurity, in particular over breaks um, or over the summer. And so those um, pressures aren't totally gone, right? They can, they can crop up in different ways. One thing that happens at some elite schools is that a student, for example, will get a check to cover maybe some other housing and food in the form of financial aid, and the student turns around and sends that money back to their families, right? Because their families need it. But now this student is in a position of having to worry about how they're paying for housing, how they're paying for food, right? So um, one of the aspects of the financial aid system that we often don't discuss is that the financial aid system doesn't often take into account that students might be supporting their families. And then when a student goes away to college, that takes a source of income away from that family. Um, and so we think about how much can the parents contribute, right, to the student's education, to their tuition or whatnot, but not, um, are we making up in some way for the loss of income that the family experiences or maybe the loss of childcare or, you know, other forms of care when the student goes away to college and so students for students, they still feel, um, you know, that they want to help their families. And so if they see that that moving to college means that the family now, um, you know, has a financial hole or, uh, you know, needs to pay for childcare or, or other sorts of help, the student feels like they're going to work or, or send some of their financial aid money back home. So obviously there are fewer of those students uh, at a campus like Princeton or like Penn, um, but those students are there. And sometimes it's actually um, harder for them to, to, to uh, kind of reveal, right? That they are facing these challenges because there's a kind of um, assumption within the institution that everybody's needs are being taken care of. My question is, uh, you have a portrayal of strivers having this ethical dilemma that they have to resolve. I don't want to lose my relationship with my community or my relatives uh, in order to uh, uh, aggrandize myself and get an education and uh, move ahead and get a job in a bank. Uh, or, uh, uh, but what about the obligation of the family to uh, kind of let go and uh, uh, let people uh, uh, fulfill their aspiration and um, and their opportunities in the next generation. I mean, right. Good. What's so the answer, I, I, what's the answer to that? <laughs> yeah, I, I. So there are a set of complicated factors at play. I do think that we should make it um, easier for you know everyone to attend college um, and to pursue higher education if if that's what they want to pursue. At the same time, I think that we should also make it possible for people to stay um, in their communities, be a part of them, and have a decent life, right? And so that requires thinking about what sorts of prospects are available for those who choose not to attend college, right? For whatever reason, because they want to stay close to their communities, they want to stay connected. Um, what are the options for them? And, and so I think that we need to think both about how are we enabling um, young people to pursue higher education if that's what they want, but also what are the alternatives, right? And are those good alternatives? Um, 
And we're seeing this as I think a really critical issue in the United States these days. If we think about rural communities, for example, um, when I was teaching at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, some of my students who were first generation um, students or low income students were coming from rural towns in North Carolina where they knew that once they left to go to college, they weren't coming back, right? Their families knew that, their communities knew that. Um, and for many of them, for both the families and the student, this is a really tough choice to make, right? And, and many of them would want to perhaps come back and have a good job in that rural town, but those jobs aren't there, right? They're not available. Um, staying in their town means not, you know, struggling financially. Um, and so I think that we need to both um, think about how to make it easier for students to want to pursue higher education to pursue it. Um, but I think we also need to think about those who stay behind, right? And what sorts of opportunities are we offering those who are um, in communities where they might be playing really important roles uh, as mentors, you know, caring for each other, being a part of the life of the community, and are committed to staying. Um, we don't want it to be that having that commitment entails that you are then consigned to poverty, right? And, and yet we put many people in that position where they think, if I stay and remain committed to my community, I am giving up the opportunity to have sort of a decent, uh, make a decent wage, right? A living wage with benefits and, and so forth. And, and I think putting people in that situation um, is um, unethical and it's something that we should think about um, and how we can change our system of higher education. So that is not the choice that so many strivers face. Well, should we be coddling strivers, uh, students that uh, have a, uh, a particular problem? Uh, should we be making the curriculum easier? At, uh, uh, Princeton University, I understand, uh, in the classics department, uh, they no longer require the study of Latin Greek. You can take it, but uh, you can also leave it. Uh, so if we make it too easy, uh, what is the value of education? Yeah, so I don't think that there's any reason to think that we need to coddle strivers. And I don't, I guess I don't see, I mean, this is a big issue, right? Like whether, for instance, classics department should require uh, Greek and Latin. My sense is that to some extent, this is a department fighting for its own survival. Uh, I don't I don't know that it's really coddling students as much as trying to make sure that they have majors. Um, so uh, maybe that's a cynical take on what's going on, but also it points to the ways in which the university has changed, right? So um, it used to be that many of the people going to university were people that were interested in pursuing academic careers or something that required an academic background, right? And so you might imagine you're going to Princeton, you're going to major in classics. Maybe you are going to go on to uh, graduate school in classics, or you're going to go um, and teach Latin or Greek uh, at, a, at a high school, right? And then you really need the language because that is critical for doing graduate work. But if you're taking, um, um, you know, you're majoring in classics because you're interested in it, but down the line, you're going to go work at, uh, I don't know, Goldman Sachs, which is probably where many more Princeton students will end up than in uh, classics graduate programs, then I think it's reasonable to think for that student, maybe having the language isn't as essential. Sadly, we've come to the end of our interview because it's been fascinating. I wish we could go on for another hour, uh, but I have a question for you, Jennifer Morton. Sure. And the question is, uh, has it become easier to move up in America? Well, the data seems to suggest not, <laughs> um, unfortunately. Um, but, I, but I guess the, the, what I would say is that I hope that my book is the sort of text that makes people 
rethink whether moving up is what we should be focusing on. Um, we need to also think about who, who is not moving up, right? And what sorts of opportunities are they being given to have a decent life um, in which they remain invested in their communities. And I think so much of what we're seeing these days is that whether it's education or the labor market is often pushing us to devalue friendship, staying committed to community, uh, family, right? And to do everything we can in the pursuit of our um, educational goals or career goals. Um, but those connections are really important to leading good lives. And so if we have a system in place that basically rewards you for not really investing in those important ethical goods, I think we don't have a very good system then and we need to rethink it. So we have to invest in our ethical goods. So Jennifer Morton, thank you so much for thank coming Thank you so by. much, Jim. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Meanwhile, take care, be well, and all the best.